So, welcome ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Back to Basics, Move Semantics, part one. I'm Klaus Siegelberger. You can consider me your guide into the realm of movement, uh, Move Semantics. So, I kind of expect there's two groups of people. The first group of people is the people who potentially do not, do not know Move Semantics yet or still struggle with the details. This talk is exactly for you, so you are very welcome. But there's also another group of people, probably, this is the guys that already know about move semantics, potentially even know more than I do. Okay, you're of course welcome too, but I have a request. So I have a couple of interactive questions. At least give the other group three seconds to think about the question and then give it away. Is it okay for you? So now if you counted the three in your head and then said yes, we have a deal. All right, perfect. So, a short uh, introduction of myself. So, as I said, I'm Klaus. I have been a C++ trainer since 2016. Additionally, I'm a senior software engineer at Siemens. You might also know one of my work. I'm the author of the Blaze C++ math library, and I'm also one of the four organizers in the, of the Munich C++ user group, which, by the way, is truly an amazing group. If you happen to be in Munich any time, check it out. Fascinating group. Um, I'm also regular presenter at C++ conferences. So this is a talk in two parts. In the first part, we are focusing on the, de uh, on, the, on the basics. We talk about the basics of move semantics, the new special member functions, and parameter conventions. Later in the second part, we dive into the details. Um, this is where it gets perhaps a little gory. All right, I have a couple of thank yous. I want to thank Scott Myers and Nikolai Yusutis. This is the two guys I learned Move Semantics from. So if you have uh, the opportunity, check out their teaching material. This is really great. And I also want to thank Howard Hinnant. He is kind of the mental father of Move Semantics. So if it wouldn't be up, if he wouldn't be, then I wouldn't have anything to tell you today. All right. Let's first of all motivate this. Let's go to the real basics. What are we about to do? Let's imagine that we have a vector of integers, quite simple. This vector would be represented like this. The vector itself, the static part, is just three pointers to int. There's a couple of addresses, of course, and then there's the dynamic part, one, two, three, four, five. This is somewhere on the heap of free store. Now I have a second vector, v2. It's empty at this point. And I as, so at this point, it is just, a, um, yeah, just the stack part. All the addresses have been zeroed out, all the pointers. Now I assign v1 to v2. Now what do we expect to happen? Oh, question. All right. The question is, um, what are the second two pointers? So by the way, if you have a question, please any time, but prefer, preferably use the microphone. It's much easier, much better for the recording, and um, of course, then I don't have to repeat the question. The second two pointers, so the first pointer points to the very first element. This is the begin pointer. The second pointer basically represents end. And the third pointer, in this case, exactly the same thing would uh, represent the very end of the memory that you have. This is something you could use to compute a capacity. Yeah. All right, all of them are zero. At this point, now I assign v1 uh, to v2. What we want to happen in this case is something called a deep copy. We want to have an exact replica of v1. And this is absolutely reasonable because this makes our code easy to understand, easy to comprehend. We take a look at this and we know that afterwards we do not have to take care of any kind of sharing. So we want to have a real copy, a deep copy. This, by the way, called move, um, value semantics. Let's do another example. Let's say we have a function create vector that is returning a vector. And again, I have an empty vector v2. v2, again, is just an empty vector, zeroed out pointers inside. Let's assume we directly assign create vector to v. Now, the first thing that happens is that, of course, I return a vector from the function. That function is, well, that, that value is something I don't really have a name for. I call it temp. And it is created by something that we can ignore now, the return value optimization. Now, it's somewhere in the calling scope of this, um, of this function call. Now, this one is assigned to v2. 
but do we really want to create a deep copy at this point? Oh, this would be a shame. Because, of course, if you do a deep copy, temp will be destroyed at the end of the statement. And we have wasted a lot of energy. That is not what we want to do. What we really want to do is actually, we would like to transfer the content of temp to v2 in a very simple way. We simply want to, well, first of all, copy the pointers. That's the first step. We cannot stop there, at, however, because at this point, there would be two vectors owning the same memory. They do not know what about each other, and deleting the memory then, of course, wrecks havoc. Now, the second step is we have to remove the pointers of the first one, and for instance, just set the pointers of the first, so this temp vector to zeros. That's great, because this is very cheap. This is so cheap that we do not really think about it as, as, uh, as an operation itself. So the idea is do the minimum amount of work to transfer temp into v2. And of course, at the end of the statement, um, okay, by the way, note this is only possible, this kind of optimization, because nobody knows about this temp except for this assignment operation. No one else holds a reference to temp. If there would be somebody else holding reference, then we would have a problem. All right, at the end of the statement, however, temp, of course, goes out of scope. And now the final result, the vector we created, is in V2. Perfect. Now you already start to like it. Hey, this is something, this is cool. Um, so why don't we apply this to the first example? Well, of course, in this case, we would have a problem. In the code, we would not see that v1 is transferred to v2. And this is the kind of the wrong way semantics. But we can do something about this. If indeed you're interested to transfer the content of v2 into v2, v1 into v2, then all we need to do is to use move. Stood move is now basically telling us this is a transfer of content. So we'll take a look at the details later, but at this point, we basically proclaim we want to transfer from v1 to v2. And we do exactly the same as before. We first of all copy the pointers, and the second step is again, we just delete the pointers, not delete, we set them to zero in v1. v1, however, in this case, lives on a little longer. So, but this is the details that you take a look at later. Right now, just remember, v1 is still alive. It will be an empty vector for quite some time, well, until the end of some scope. All right, let's take a look at the details. On the left-hand side, again, we, uh, we now see the, the vector, standard vector, a, sh a small excerpt from standard vector. And on the right, we see the example that we saw before. The first statement that we uh, analyzed was this one. v2 is equal to v1. Now this is, the v1 is now something called an L value. Oh my, now he's starting with technical terms. Okay, let's clarify the technical terms first, at least a little bit. There's more back to basics talks that go much into, de uh, into more detail here. L value. And there's also something called an R value. And this is what people usually are a little confused about. So there's a historic reason why they're called L and R value. The L in this uh, assignment, that is an L value, simply because it appears on the left of the assignment. And the other thing, the R, that is an R value because it appears on the right. Strictly speaking, an R value can only be on the right of the assignment. An L value could theoretically also be on the, on the right side, but, well, an L value can be on the left side, so it, it has a certain name. This is, however, only the historical thing. This is where the name comes from do not really remember this from a C++ point of view. Unfortunately, it does not work well anymore. I'll give you a simple example. Let's say we have a string, then S plus S is equal to S is actually valid code. It will compile, will not do something reasonable, but it is valid code. And it is kind of reversed because now the S on the right is an L value. And on the left, actually, we have an R value. So it's kind of reversed. It's pretty unnatural, it's pretty surprising again. But there's a much better rule for C++, something that you can remember and that works absolutely fascinatingly well. The thing on the right, the S is an L value because it has a name. 
a name that you have chosen, an identifier that you have deliberately uh, uh, yeah, put into, put, was chosen for this variable, an L value. Now on the left, however, you have an R value because it does not have a name. So the result of S plus S, this temporary, you did should not choose a name for, and hence it is an R value. That's the entire um, difference between L and R value. Now, V1 has a name, hence it is an L value. And L values, well, okay, they bind to the assignment operator that you see here on the left. That is perfectly okay. This assignment operator now would do a copy because it assumes that you indeed want to have this copy. Everything's fine. Now let's go to the second um, assignment. Create vectors, uh, V2 is equal to create vector. Prior to C++11, this would actually have created a copy. So it is an R value, we said this before. Prior to C++11, this would actually have created a copy because there's only one assignment operator for that case. And that is, I have to say, was the essential problem. I cannot distinguish, I could not distinguish between the first case and the second case. The first case, the L value is copied. The second case, well, I want to deal with this differently, but unfortunately, as long as there's only one assignment operator, it would also do a copy. For that reason, they introduced what you probably have seen before, R value references. So, using two ampersands for a reference makes it a so-called R value reference. An R value reference does exactly what you would expect. This R value reference takes R values. So R values bind to R value references, L values naturally bind to L value references. So with R value references in play, the other kind of reference is just called R value reference, uh, L value reference. And now with an R value reference, we have actually something to make a difference. So the R value can now bind to the R value reference. And this function knows about the fact that it is an R value. This function now can assume that you want this to be transferred. Well, it's a temporary anyway, a temporary that is not needed afterwards. And as I said before, there's exactly one reference to this kind of vector, so this particular temporary. So I can do a move. So this operator, the one that takes an R value reference, moves. All right. Now let's take a look at the third one. V1 is, okay, question to you, what kind of uh, value? An L value, it has a name. However, the move operation now makes it an R value. I basically declare, please treat this V1 as if it would be an R value. Officially, not to confuse you, but officially this is called an X value. Oh, one more term, expiring value. It's basically just for the C++ guys to have some vocabulary to, to deal with this explicitly, but basically make V1 now some kind of R value. And because we deal with this as an R value, it will bind to the R value reference, exactly where we want it to be. So it will be treated as an R value, and I move the content of V1 into V2. Now V1 is, well, still alive. It lives on. We have transferred the content from V1 into V2. Great, this is what we wanted. But V1 lives on. It has a name. You can still use it afterwards. And this makes it, to some extent, a little dangerous. So, officially the standard says this is a move from object. A move from basically says, don't use it anymore. Yeah, okay, if you know a little more, perhaps you have some ideas how to misuse it, of course, but the general advice would be just leave it be. Just wait until it naturally dies, so at the end of its scope it will be properly destroyed via its destructor, but don't do anything special with it anymore. Officially there's only three operations that you're allowed to use on a move from object. The first one happens implicitly, that is um, the destructor. The destructor, of course, will eventually be called. And then there's two other operations that you can do deliberately. The first one is a copy assignment, and a second one is a move assignment. So you can assign to this thing again, and suddenly it becomes a valid object again. Yeah, you can again use it, you can um, work with this properly. But as long as you did not reassign it, just leave it be. The interesting question now would be, what does a move do? 
How does Move look like? And you might be surprised to find that Move is actually pretty simple. This is Move. A Move is essentially a static cast. Okay, so static cast to blah, 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 ref, ref. And this is also what Move returns, blah, 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 ref, ref. So a Move returns an R value reference. It does not really move anything. The only thing it does is it makes whatever you give it to an R value reference. And henceforth, it is treated as an R value and th therefore it binds to, for instance, the, um, this move constructor, a move assignment operator. So move does not really move anything. The usual question is, does the compiler give me any warnings when I try to use something that is moved from? No, the compiler will be absolutely silent of this, uh, about this, and as a simple reason, static cast. A cast is, as you know, an adult feature. You know better than the compiler, and if the compiler says, well, you know better, then he will not warn you about any misuse later. So you are on your own here, except, of course, that there's other tools. So static code analysis tools might warn you about some access to, or some use of a move from object, the compiler will not, thanks to static cast. All right, so now you understand that move indeed does not really move anything, but it, that does make a difference in terms of semantics. It is a semantic transfer of ownership. So some people actually um, argue that it should not be called move, but something like transfer content, transfer ownership would be a much longer name. Move is probably a little nicer. But this is the semantic part about it. It is a move from a semantic point of view, a transfer of content. It is not a physical move. Nothing physically moves anywhere. All right. A short summary in between. So containers in C++ employ value semantics. This is something that we desire. This makes our code easy to understand, easy to comprehend. We do not have to figure out where is sharing happening uh, under the hood. In pre C11, this led, of course, to a lot of potentially expensive copy operations. Thanks to the introduction to R value references, now we are able to distinguish between R L values and R values and can therefore react accordingly. We can deal with L values differently than we can deal with R values. And R value references basically just represent modifiable objects that you do not know, that you no longer need temporaries, all things that you have explicitly declared to be temporaries, and basically explicitly said, I don't need this anymore, please transfer content, please optimize. All right, now let's take a look at some implementation details. There is two functions that you need to make this entire magic happening. And these two functions um, I show in an example of a widget class. So class widget has three data members, an int, as a representative of a fundamental type, a string as a representative of a class type, and a unique pointer. Admittedly, also a class type, but a special one. That's a pointer type reference semantics. And the two functions that I mentioned is these two, the move constructor and the move assignment operator. This is the two functions that are now also added to the set of special member functions. So now in total we have six, the default constructor, the two copy operations, the two move operations, the new ones, and of course the destructor. The canonical syntax for these two, or canonical signature of these two functions, is one argument of exactly the type of the function, uh, function the class, ref ref. This is indeed the canonical signature. There's not a lot, not, not a lot of difference you can make. You can actually add a const here, but it does not really help you. The purpose is that I do modify the object that I'm given, so, well, a const doesn't help. And as soon as you leave out any reference, it would be the copy constructor or the copy assignment operator. So this is indeed the canonical signature. For this class, actually, your life is easy. You simply can define these two default, or perhaps even leave it to the compiler. You do not have to explicitly mention them. This is great. All of the things that, the, all of the data members are properly movable. The int, okay, this is fundamental. The string also knows how to transfer content to some other string, and also the unique pointer is equipped with the right functions. So this is exactly what you would like to have. This is the best possible situation. There's a name for this, 
So the core, there's a core guideline C20 for that. If you can avoid defining default operations, do. And this core guideline also mentions the unofficial, or perhaps even official name for this, the rule of zero. This is where you want to live. This is what you usually want to use. Your life is easy. Your life is, yeah, comfortable. Let's, for the sake of this talk, of course, let's assume that I have to do something extra. So let's assume, for instance, that the unique pointer is just a raw pointer. And suddenly our life gets much, much more complicated. Because now we actually have to deal with these two functions. We can no longer make them default. We have to implement them ourselves in order to make this work properly. And let's take a look at the implementation details. First of all, of the move constructor. Well, the goal of the move constructor is to transfer the content of the given object W into this object. And of course, we want to leave W, so the past object, in a valid but undefined state. So this does not sound great. Of course, undefined is always something that is a little vague. This basically means it can be any state. It must be a valid state, but we cannot predict the state that it will be in. All right, how do we achieve these goals? The first step is probably just to copy the int. Okay, no ill here, no ill effect, everything's working. Then, well, let's do this with a string too. So let's move the string. Okay, now a couple of people, as you know about this, probably fainted. Now, unfortunately, this is not what we might believe it is. In this line, we actually do not move the string. What do we do with the string? We copy the string. And this is exactly what we do not want to do. We want, of course, to be as efficient as possible. We would like it to move. Why doesn't it move? Who knows? Correct. The string has a name, but also the W has a name. So the widget that I'm passing has a name. And because of that, it is simply an L value. And an L value is something that I cannot or should not move. Of course, an L value, since it has a name, is still needed. Hence, I do a copy. However, there's of course an easy workaround. Okay, I should perhaps point out um, this, this uh, mystery here. So yes, it is an L value. The type, however, of course, suggests differently. Widget ref ref. This is, I, I, I admit, a little confusing. R uh, 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 reference to an R, uh, R value reference, and then it still is an L value. It may be confusing, but it's easy to explain if you think about it like this. It is indeed an R value in the calling scope. At the point where we call this function, it is an R value, else we would not end up in this function. However, inside the function, it needs to be an L value again. If it wouldn't be an L value, if we wouldn't have a name, we could not use it. And so, well, it has to be an L value again. But we can easily make this work again by using move. We explicitly move the string to the other string. And this is perfectly fine because we know, thanks to the type, that it actually is an R value. So ultimately, this is now moving the string properly. Now I apply the same operation now also to the int. Now it does not make any difference. The int is still just copied. And there's no speed up at all. However, it is a nice and a pretty reasonable um, convention. Just move all your data members, regardless of whether this is ints, so fundamental types, or class types, then it's, first of all, very heterogeneous. And second of all, in case, and you might see this in, in the remainder of this talk, in case you change the type of this I, you not have to go back here and, and basically fix the code. It will always work. It will never do the, the wrong thing. And so this is why I acquire this um, convention now in, for the remainder of the talk. All right. And of course, I also move the pointer. It's not really moved, it's also just copied. There's nothing I can do better than copying it. But as I said, I now use this convention. We're not quite done yet. I copied the pointer, essentially. But unfortunately, at this point, we have 
two objects that point to the same memory. And the basic assumption of this widget is that this pointer is an owning pointer. So now I would have two destructors that would destroy the same content. And this is bad. So there's an absolutely necessary further line. We have to explicitly set the pointer of the W widget to null. Without this, it would break pretty badly. Now you might think, okay, so by the way, we have now, first of all, um, resolved our first goal. We have now effectively transferred the content of W into this. Now we're there. The entire content of the right-hand side object is now in this, perfect. Now let's take a look at more, a couple of more details. So first of all, you might feel that these two operations, well, you always have to think about this. You always have to remember that pointers are special, that other, the other pointer, in case it's owning, has to be set to null. There is a little helper that is called std exchange. std exchange is a function that sets the given pointer, so WPI, to null pointer, and it returns the old value of WPI. That is, of course, the value that I want to have in my own pointer. And that is a nice helper that basically makes this a little more compact, and you might not forget this. Although it's nice, just for educational purposes, I now simply return to the old thing. I want just to show a couple of more details. All right, there is another core cool guideline. Make move operations no except. So let's do this, but let's also ask why is this necessary? Why is this something that is not like consider moving it no except, but make it no except? So first of all, it's actually not wrong. Moving the eye is, well, no brainer, this can never fail. This will never throw an exception. And also the pointer is a no brainer, it will never fail. The string, well, we just have to look it up and find that the move operation for the string is no except two. And so this is not a lie, this is perfect, this is no except. You're also, of course, setting the pointer to null. But there is a good reason that the core guidelines point this out. It has to do with performance. And in order to demonstrate this, I've now written a little example program. So, first of all, let's say that I create a long string, longer than um, necessary, so long enough that this is not um, using the small string optimization. Then I have a vector of widgets. At this point, it is empty. N is the number of widgets I want to create. The next, I'm running a for loop, and I'm creating N widgets, and I'm pushing back them back into the vector by means of move. And then, of course, I measure the time this takes, and eventually I just print the runtime. If I do not make my copy constructor no except, then I both Clang and GCC, they um, show exactly the same result. Solve this in 0 0.005 seconds. Okay, just a number at this point. However, if I use no except, then suddenly the runtime goes down by 60% to only a 2.2, uh, 0, 0, 0, 0.002 seconds. And it's quite a bit. That is not just a 1% or 2% difference. This is very, a very significant change. The reason has to do with, indeed, exceptions. Pushback gives you a guarantee. It gives you the so-called strong exception safety guarantee. If you, if any exception is thrown in pushback, it is as if nothing has happened. It is as if you would not have called the function. This is a very strong and a very valuable guarantee. But as soon as we use move, as soon as objects are transferred, I am changing my inner content. And this is why pushback has been to be pretty defensive. If you have, if you promise to not throw in your move operation, then pushback will indeed move. It cannot fail, it will not destroy the old state, everything's fine. But if you do not give this promise, unfortunately it has to do a copy. And so if you do not use no, no except, it basically falls back to the pre-C++11 behavior, which is pretty unfortunate, but this is why the core guideline is pretty clear, make your operation no except. All right, so let's do this. Then, what about this WI? I have set the other pointer to null, but I did not really set WI to zero or some other default. There's yet another core guideline, C, uh, 64, 
a move operation should move and leave its source in a valid state. This core guideline has a note. We don't read all of it. It's the first part that's interesting. Ideally, that move from should be the default value of the type. Ensure that unless there is an exceptionally good reason not to. So if you read this, then this basically means that we actually want to set this to zero. Okay, so let's do this. However, this is not what the default would do. So if I indeed would have a unique pointer, if I would choose the default implementation, the default would not set this to zero. So if the default is not doing it, apparently it's not such a bad thing. Of course, by setting this to zero, we have now also perfectly achieved our second goal. W is now in a valid but undefined state. Actually, it is in a default state, which is what the core guideline suggests. But if we leave this operation, well, it's also in a valid state. We just did not reset the int to zero. It is just the value that it had before. And this is also a perfectly valid state. However, undefined from a higher perspective because I cannot really predict what it will be. From a performance point of view, however, it's of course reasonable because if I don't really have to set it to zero, then leaving the out is just a tiny little bit faster. So this is now kind of the canonical move constructor. This is what I would argue is um, what you would have to write um, if you indeed have to write it yourself. All right. Now in this, uh, canonical form, you see something like two phases, phase one and phase two. In phase one, I do a member-wise move. All the members are explicitly moved from W into this. In phase two, I'm explicitly dealing with pointers. Pointers are unfortunately special. Pointers have to be handled explicitly. So I have to say owning pointers. If it's not an owning pointer, you probably don't care, but an owning pointer is special. I have to deal with this explicitly. So please don't forget this. This is a usual, um, a usual kind of problem. If I, however, make this a unique pointer again, so going back to what we started with, then what I can omit is phase two. By the way, now see, I changed the type. I do not have to adapt phase one. So I moved WPI, and this is still exactly the right thing to do. Now I'm only left with phase one. If this is what you only need, if phase one is all you need indeed, then you are fine with the default. The default move constructor does only do phase one, a member-wise move. Move member one, move member two, move member three, and so on. This is what the default would do. And note, the default is also no except. And so you don't have to worry. The default gives you the whole package. And as I said, this is exactly what you would like to have. This is the perfect class design following the rule of zero. All right. Now, going back to this, um, this form that I said is the canonical form for an implementation that you do, of course there's other variations. Of course there's options you have. I cannot show you all possible implementations. I can only show you the canonical form and hope that this is what you use most of the time if indeed you have to write this function yourself. I would follow the advice of Howard Hinnant. I think the most important takeaway is that programmers should be leery of following patterns without thought. So think about what you really need. Think about how to transfer in, a mo in the most efficient way the content of the other object into this. If there is something better you can do than this canonical form, of course do it. This is all about performance. This is all about efficiency. And you can do whatever is necessary uh, to be as fast as possible. All right. Having covered the move constructor, let's take a look at the move assignment operator. Question. So, can you use the mic? Thank you. Can you go back, can you go back to the uh, page with the unique pointer? Uh, yeah, so we, when you stood moved the PI, did that automatically reset W's unique pointer or leave it alone? Because the stood yeah. moves just a static cast. Correct. So basically, you answered the question yourself. If this move WPI would also nicely reset the WPI to null, oh, this would be nice. A lot of people are usually asking me, wouldn't this be, um, wouldn't this be exactly what I want? 
there is the problem with non-owning pointers. A non-owning pointer perhaps should not be reset. And so there is no general move that always resets the other pointer. It depends on what you really want to do. In case of an owning pointer, therefore, you unfortunately have to do it yourself. And you have to think about it. Else, it's, it's usually a serious bug. Um, no, but no, it's not done automatically. The string is different because the string, of course, has the move operations itself. The okay, this one, sorry. Then it was misunderstanding. This one. So do I have to move the unique pointer? Um, so this, this version. Um, yes, I have to. The unique pointer, again, it would be an L value. I would copy the unique pointer. OK, now I got the question completely. Yes, the unique pointer is completely reset, absolutely. That is part of the class. OK, sorry for the misunderstanding. Yeah, so the unique pointer as a class type knows exactly what to do. It resets its internal pointer automatically. And this is exactly why phase one is perfectly enough. You don't have to, um, you don't have to do anything. Class types are much, uh, much easier to handle than pointers. All right, Did, okay. All right, then moving forward, let's take a look at the move assignment operator. And of course this one, oh, question, I'm sorry. sorry. Yes, yeah, so if you have, if you have this case where it's uh, an owning pointer, are you gonna, if you try to use the default move um, constructor, are you gonna get a compile error? If not, what are you gonna get? Okay, I hardly understand you, so Mike is not particularly good. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Yes, so if you have this case where you have an owning pointer and you use the default move constructor, are you gonna get a compile error? And if not, what are you gonna get? So you're asking whether the, in the default constructor, if I get an error to do that. No. No. So if you don't, imp if you don't yeah. implement it, if you just said So the acoustics is just so bad. There's so much echo yeah. that, so you have to find the right distance. Okay. It's, it's really hard. <laughs> if you just say equals, equal, if you just say equals default. Okay. Yeah. Are you going to get a compile error because you have a type that's not movable? Okay. So let's, let me find the right slide. Now I got it. This one. Well, so, but instead of the unique pointer, you had a raw pointer. Okay, basically, if I have a pointer now with default, do I get a compiler error? No. It could be that this is perfect. If it's an unowning pointer, perhaps this is exactly what you would like to have. So unfortunately, this is not a compilation error. There is no warning. Oh, um, you forgot to um, deal with a pointer. No, unfortunately, no. There's not a lot of help here. So you have to really remember yourself. Okay, other questions while I try to find the slide again. All right. Then move assignment operator. It is very, very similar to what we've seen before, the move constructor. First of all, we should think about what we want to achieve. It is a little more. We now have three points. The new point is the first one. We also want to clean up all visible resources in the, um, in, our, um, yeah, in our own object. We want, again, to transfer the content of W into this and leave W in a valid but undefined state. So it is similar, but it is a little more. But this is reasonable because the assignment operator is, of course, changing an existing object, whereas the constructor is creating something new. The constructor is usually simpler. Now, the first step we do is, again, we move the int. Again, I use the convention to always move. Yes, again, this does not do any kind of speed up, but it is just a little more canonical. Then we also now do it correctly. We move the string. Again, if you omit the move here, we do the wrong thing. It would compile, it would work, but it, we would indeed do a copy, so we correctly move. And then we move the pointer. Also okay. But now in this case, I have introduced another kind of error. I have now overwritten my own pointer, my PI. Previously, there was some value in there, some value to the uh, content I, I, I own. Now it's gone. So what you must not forget in the move assignment operator is 
to explicitly delete PI. Also, this is not part of the move thing. This is something that um, you have to deal with yourself. So usually the first line is delete. And not just the first line. If you have more resources than the beginning, the begin block is usually just what you do in the destructor as well. So unfortunately, there is apparently some kind of duplication. All right, so we dealt with our old resource. So we cleaned up all visible resources properly. Perfect, first goal is set. Then again, afterwards, I reset the pointer of WPI to null pointer. Now, at this point, we have again effectively transferred the content of W into this. Great. Again, you can use a std exchange. It makes the code a little easier to read and you do not tend to forget to um, set the pointer if you make this the habit, exchange pointers. But again, although it's great, for educational reasons, I just show these two operations explicitly. Now, in this, these two operations now, some people use a different form. They kind of collect these three into a swap. What you can also do is you swap PI and WPI. This is still, perhaps unfortunately, a common way to implement the move assignment operator. It is unfortunately a, less, a little less deterministic. So there's a couple of arguments that usually against this form. Yes, of course, it's very elegant, it's very short, pretty expressive, but in this case, you are transferring your old resource into W. This is fine, it will be taken care of eventually, but what you don't know exactly is when. Eventually, at some point in the future, this, your resource will be destroyed. But since you cannot tell anymore how long it will still stay alive, it's, well, less deterministic. Also, if you're counting operations, admittedly just pointer operations, there's one point operation more. And so it's a little less efficient. Yes, it's elegant, but I tend to just recommend use this form explicitly. All right, question. again, do question, not... Question, please. Can you hear me? I'm not sure. Yeah. Sorry, very nervous. Um, so assuming as you're cleaning up your resource before you do the move, um, this would all go horribly wrong if the, um, the, um, the reference you were passing in was actually a reference to the object you were swapping into, moving into. Okay, so, I, again, so, unfortunately, only caught half of it. I'm sorry. Sorry, I'm, so, really, I'm very nervous. So, I'm assuming... Self-assignment, yeah, all right. self-assignment. So with, when you do, it would only happen if you had a stud move on an L value, I assume, yes. because if it's an R value, it's a temp. Okay, this so, is a very good question. Is the, with, when you do that static cast to an R value, would I still be able to have a check to check that it was not the same as this? All right, so ac <laughs> actually it is, so self-assignment, in short, a move to self. This is possible, of course, I could simply write something like W is equal to move W. This would obviously be a move to self. What would happen in this case? Well, let's think it through. Delete PI, I would delete my own resource first. All right, now it's gone. Now I simply copy my pointer into my own pointer. I move my string into S. Now, of course, this depends on what the string does. And then I move my own pointer into my own pointer and set myself to null. So essentially afterwards, I'm just kind of um, in, a, in a default state. Not quite because I copy the pointer, uh, sorry, the, the int, but it's, it's like as if I moved from. Move to self is different than copy to self. If you copy to ourselves, so w is equal to w, we assume that nothing changes. The object is still in the same state. This is the basic um, assumption. Move to self, however, basically means we have no assumption about the outcome. What, what should it be? W is equal to move W. You explicitly said move W. You basically say, I don't need this guy anymore. So this is actually perfectly fine. I do not have to protect against self-assignment. Afterwards, it is moved from. If you feel uncomfortable with this, of course you can add an if statement. If address of right hand side is not equal to uh, this, then do this, also okay. The result is valid but undefined. 
So move to self is indeed different than copy to self. Yeah, you can feel comfortable by just making this as fast as possible. What must not happen, however, is of course a crash. A crash is, uh, is of course out of the question. Okay, question. So essentially move to self is undefined? Okay, a little louder, sorry. So uh, move to self is that then considered undefined behavior? Or? No, move to self is not undefined behavior. Afterwards, however, this value is in an undefined state, as usually, a move from object. A move from basically means, okay, could be in any state, I don't need it anymore, I just leave it die. By the way, e w is equal to move w. This is probably the only um, situation where you obviously move some valid object into itself. I am only aware of an, one other situation where move to self happens, and this is in a swap. In the this, in this second um, move operation inside a swap, yeah, swap usually three moves, in the second one, I move to self, but I move from a moved from object into a moved from object, if I indeed um, do move, uh, sorry, a swap. So also in this case, this is perfectly fine. You do not really have to protect against move to self. Perhaps it's a little counterintuitive, I know, but this is also what you um, find as the, the common advice. I should mention there is a core guideline. Um, this core, the core guideline says, protect yourself. However, there's a note in the core guidelines that says, well, of course, we try to be a little defensive. We don't know what could possibly happen, and therefore, um, they take the point, do the if. However, I have never seen it fail anywhere. So this is indeed kind of the canonical form for the move assignment operator. Okay, no except also, don't forget this. And of course, we can again um, assign the integer, this is again purely optional. The default would not do it, so I just leave it. We have again achieved all our goals. The object is now in a valid but undefined state. In this case, you see three phases. The first phase is kind of cleanup. Yes, to some extent, a repetition of what you do in the destructor. I would sort it, I would structure it differently, but yes, it could be a copy of what you do in the destructor. Then in phase two, I again do a member-wise move. Move member one, move member two, etc. And phase three is again an explicit dealing with pointers. This is something that again you cannot forget. As soon as I make the pointer a unique pointer again, I can omit phase one and phase three. The unique pointer knows full well how to do these operations. And again, if you're left with this one phase, if it's just moving all the members, then you're fine with just using the default. So in this case, I could again say default, and again, note is this no except again. So it is much, much easier and much better for you if you can rely on the compiler-generated default. There's one trick that I want to show you, one possible implementation of the move assignment operator that's slightly different. Actually, this is not the move assignment operator anymore. Strictly speaking, it's the copy assignment operator. But if you write it like this, it could actually be both. It's like the copy move assignment operator. I pass the widget by value. By doing this, you can actually just swap the, um, the, the widget internally, and then you're done. If you pass in the assignment an L value, the argument would now be copied. I would use the copy constructor, and then I would swap the copy. If I would have an R value, so some kind of temporary, then for the construction of this temporary object in the, um, on the, the object here in the, uh, the argument, I would use the move constructor. And so I only have to write the move constructor, and here I basically get the move for free. It is not as efficient as if you would write both functions, but it's a nice trick if you just want to quickly um, cover the operations. So it's kind of a nice fallback um, if you don't want to sketch out everything right away. All right. Now there's just one more detail that, um, that I want to add. When does the compiler add these uh, special member functions? A question. So I have now implemented my own swap. I, I didn't mention this, I'm sorry. So I now have a swap in the widget, so one argument, not two. In this, of, okay, now if in case you use move in there, okay, 
then it suddenly is different. If you add your own swap and you, if you just say, okay, I swap pointers, I do an int, whatever, then of course it would work. Yeah, so not std swap, your own swap, yeah, which you might have anyway. All right, when does the compiler generate um, these functions? Well, there is a certain, well, some arcane set of rules. The default move operations are generated if no copy operations or destructor is usually defined. And the move, the default, oh, sorry, the default copy operations are generated if no move operation is user defined. Well, note, equal default and equal delete officially count as user defined. User defined basically means you mention these functions in your class. You do not necessarily have to implement them yourself, you just write them like here into your class. All right, let's play a little game, one minute. Um, let's assume I have this class X. I want to have a virtual destructor. This is why I um, write the destructor myself. But the default is entirely fine, so I say equal default. Does the compiler now generate the copy operations? Yes or no? Okay, to make it a little quicker, it says yes. Okay, a couple of people say yes. Anyone with no? Uh, so when does the compiler generate copy? The default copy operations are generated if no move operation is usually defined. At this point, I did not deal with move at all. So the compiler would generate the copy operations. Very nice. What about the to move operations? No move. There is no move because I have user-defined a destructor. So I have to admit, for a virtual class, I don't really see a point of move operations, but for the sake of learning, let's say that we need them and that I want to default them. So now I add the to move operations to my class. What about the to copy operations? Does the compiler generate the to copy operations? So, no, unfortunately it does not. Because now I have user defined the to, cop, uh, the, the to move operations. So now I have to get them back by defaulting the copy operations too. And now what you see is something called the rule of five or something that you see in C core guideline 21. If you define or delete any default operation, define or delete them all. So commonly this is known to be the rule of zero, uh, uh, sorry, your rule of five or also, if you also count the default constructor, the rule of six. So either you live, indeed what I said before, by the rule of zero, or you better define all of them. This is easier, easier for the readers of your code. They will not want, uh, wonder, do you know about these arcane rules? Are you sure what you're doing? Because indeed, they are a little um, arcane. All right. That is the basics of move semantics. There is just one more core guideline that I want to show. C15 prefers simple and conventional ways of passing information. So you might now wonder, this move semantic, does it appear in, ma in many places? Do I have to sprinkle my code with RL references? Likely no. It is indeed something that you can consider an optimization. C15 gives a very nice list of um, yeah, conventions that you should use for return values and passing parameters. And if you browse the, the advice here, you will find move only in two places. You'll find this in two special cases, in and retain copy and in and move from. Special cases, there's an input parameter and I need a copy. In this case, you can optimize. You can optimize based on whether it's L or R value. And in and move from is yet a more special case. I have an in parameter and I know that I move from it. Okay, then this is now with R value references easy to um, deal with by just taking this as an R value reference. So the place where these R value references creep up is primarily the move constructor and the move assignment operator. This is the two functions we use the most often. In other cases, it is primarily for optimization purposes. All right, and with us, we are basically at the end of the first part. And this is what I hope you now feel like. You now feel like, okay, and I thought move is difficult. 
it's just copying a couple of pointers here, and okay, yeah, I have to, I should not forget to set a couple of pointers to zero, but ultimately, it's not that difficult. And so hopefully, this is the feeling that you also have if you come back to the second part, where we climb downhill a little bit. Okay, thank you very much.